a football bombshell as senior FIFA officials are arrested on corruption charges. The African Growth and Opportunity Act is set for renewal. Is it time to revise the agreement? And video of a barbecue like none you've ever seen goes viral. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCory. This is Africa 54. Bribes, kickbacks and payoffs. Football's global governing body FIFA, FIFA is rocked Wednesday by a massive U.S. federal corruption indictment against current and former top officials. Now, the U.S. announcement was followed by a separate notification of a probe by Swiss authorities into allegations connected to the awarding of the 2018 and 2022 World Cups. Uh, several FIFA officials were arrested today in Zurich. VOA's Jeff Castor has our report. The U.S. indictment includes 47 counts against 14 people covering charges of racketeering, wire fraud, and money laundering in a scheme that prosecutors say involves sports media executives paying or agreeing to pay more than $150 million in exchange for marketing rights to tournaments. Switzerland's Federal Office of Justice says seven FIFA officials were arrested Wednesday pending extradition to the United States. At a news conference in Geneva, FIFA Director of Communications Walter de Gregorio told reporters, overall, this is a good thing for FIFA. This for FIFA is good. It's not good in terms of image, it's not good in terms of reputation, but in terms of cleaning up, in terms of everything what we did in the last four years, in terms of the reform process, this is good. FIFA President Sepp Blatter is not among those being charged. He's up for re-election to a fifth term on Friday. The international football community has, for the most part, reacted with shock. The president of the French Football League, Frédéric Thérèse, says it is a blow to the league's image. This morning, I am profoundly shocked, as you are, as the whole world is, and above all, I'm deeply saddened by the image it gives of football. Remember that fight against corruption in France is one of the biggest issues for me, as the recent case of alleged match-fixing in Nîmes shows. If the facts are proven surrounding corruption in the giving of gifts relating to one decision or another, it would be extremely serious, and I would want the Swiss police and legal system to see this affair through to the end. FIFA's de Gregory Rio says there will be no changes in upcoming football tournaments despite the allegations. Jeff Custer, VOA News, Washington. Well, joining us now for more insight into today's FIFA scandal news is VOA's corruption correspondent Jeffrey Young. Hello, Jeffrey. Hello. Good to uh, see you, Vincent. Good to see you. Now, uh, what a big day uh, in the world. Uh, this FIFA investigation has been going on for a long time, and it did involve so many people over a long period of time. Uh, how did it happen? They have been looking at all sorts of aspects of FIFA for several decades. In fact, in the course of this investigation, they went all the way back into the middle 90s. There are many different ways that corruption can take place in a situation like this. At the very top, you have FIFA, the world sanctioning and approval body for football all over the world. But FIFA is made up of six sub-organizations based on region. Africa has its own organization, North America, South America, Asia, etc. The crux of what has been going on is at all these different levels, you have marketing companies and media organizations. I run a huge television network. I want access to coverage mm -hmm. of World Cup qualifying games in Africa. So I go to the African sanctioning body that sits below mm -hmm. FIFA and go to these people and sit down and have a conversation and say, and what does it take for me to get the television rights to be the exclusive broadcaster right. for the next qualifying games? Yeah. So you see, the corruption so the, builds layer by layer over, all the way to the and top. And over time, and the motivation is there. The question is, some people have a accused FIFA of not being an open organization. He actually interviewed somebody today uh, and he said that there is a need for reform. Chris Eaton, who is the executive director of Sport Integrity at the International Institute for Sport Security, very ironically, Vince, in Doha, Qatar, oh. the site of the 2022 exactly. games. Yeah. He calls FIFA one of the most opaque organizations in the world. 
Decisions are made behind closed doors. There is an executive committee within FIFA that operates without interaction with people, does not communicate with people. Decisions are not explained. Everything is behind closed doors. And you know, when things are behind closed doors, sometimes people can be persuaded. Yes. And there's various ways Very of doing Very quickly, in that. a few seconds for the benefit of our viewers, okay. why are some of these officials being brought to the United States? Simply, the United States has two laws that reach globally. One of them is called FCPA, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Any activity that takes place anywhere in the world that involves a U.S. company, a U.S. bank, if it's a foreign company that has deposits in an American bank, then FCPA applies. The other one is typically used for gangsters, RICO, the Racketeering and Corrupt Organizations Act. Both of these are in play by the U.S. Justice Department in the indictment of these 14 individuals. Well, Jeff, this is just the beginning. You might be back in the coming days. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> well, Jeffrey Young is VOA's corruption correspondent. Thank you for joining us today. Now, Burundi continues to be a nation on edge following weeks of violent clashes and civil unrest. Most residents of the capital, Bujumbura, are being restricted to their neighborhoods by heavily armed police to stop them from protesting against President Pierre Nkurunziza's bid for a third term. For the latest developments in Burundi, VOS Eddie Ruema joins us live by phone from Bujumbura. Eddie, uh, first uh, tell us what is the mood of uh, things there today? Ruema, Eddie, are you on the line? Edward Reimer in Bujumbura, can you hear me? Looks like we are running into trouble uh, uh, with the line there from uh, Bujumbura in Rwanda. Hopefully we'll rejoin him later. Now, officials in Tanzania remain on high alert after some 4,000 refugees from Burundi became infected with cholera, triggering fears of a growing humanitarian crisis in Africa's Great Lakes region. The UNHCR has appealed to donors for $207 million to help it deal with the refugee situation. For more on the challenge UNHCR is facing, Karine de Gruyel, UNHCR spokesperson, joins us live via Skype from Geneva, Switzerland. Karine, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you very much, Vincent. Now, first, uh, there has been a kind of a revision in the numbers of refugees. In, uh, previously, we thought there were about 100 and over, how many are, are you saying are out of Burundi? Yes, we have, uh, we had to revise our, our figures. Um, the number now, we're talking about 74,000 people. This doesn't mean that people are not leaving Burundi anymore. Uh, you may remember the story we talked about last week and that you just mentioned, Kagunga, where we had the cholera outbreak. We have now managed to evacuate everyone from Kagunga uh, to Kigoma and to the refugee camp. And rather than more than 50,000 people we initially estimated to be there, uh, we have now evacuated 35,000 people. So that counts for uh, the reduction of numbers. But this by no means means that uh, people are not leaving Burundi as we speak. Now, tell us about uh, the challenges. A few weeks ago, we spoke about some enormously uh, you know, big challenges in those camps. What has changed? Are things any better? The challenges are still there. Um, depending on, on, on which country, there's a challenge of finding enough clean drinking water for so many people, uh, in particularly in Rwanda, that's an issue. Uh, in other uh, communities, uh, the, the services, health services and others uh, are, are stretched. Uh, we have to work around the clock to set up these services in the refugee camp. And that's why uh, we launched this appeal last, uh, late last week of 207 million with 17 partners. Uh, that's what we think we need to uh, be able to assist and protect up to 200,000 Burundian refugees for the coming six months. But we're not at the number of 200,000 uh, yet. This is our planning figure. You're anticipating uh, we're for... Working with. Yeah. Now, what has been the response up to this point? Perhaps it's a bit too early to tell. We launched the appeal, uh, the refugee response plan on, on Friday. So far, we have some indications of donors who are willing to support uh, us, but it's a bit too early to give numbers at this moment. In terms of the cholera infections, uh, now the numbers are up to 4,000. 
do you fear that they're going to increase even quickly or th is this situation under some kind of uh, control up to the point up to this point yes we do we do think it's under control over the last six days we haven't seen any cholera related deaths so that's very good news also the rate of new cases has slowed down significant significantly when we first reported this we were talking about up to 400 uh, new cases of cholera a day uh, now it's uh, less than 100 so that that's very good news and it seems that the efforts that we have made of moving people from Kagunga uh, and setting up treatment centers uh, sanitation facilities uh, are starting to have effect in terms of uh, the other partners you're working with how are you coordinating the activities so that everything can be done smoothly uh, to ensure that uh, the refugees are getting all the help they need from all the organizations in that region? Yes, we are working with 17 partners at the moment. Uh, that number may increase. These partners include UN sister agencies, uh, non-governmental organizations, and of course our government counterparts. Um, so it's basically dividing up the work, who takes care of what. Some people uh, do sanitation, other people do shelter. And uh, our role is, is coordinating to make sure that there is no duplication, so that there is not too much of one item and not enough in the other. And of course, we, we do our own activities uh, as well, uh, distribution of, uh, of essential relief items like blankets and, and other mosquito nets that are necessary. Yeah. Now, um, I, uh -huh. so, yes, I know, I know that you, you, you handle mostly people who have left the country and gone to another region, but uh, what is the situation of those who have been displaced but are still within uh, Burundi? It's been very difficult to get a good picture of, of that situation. Actually, uh, my colleagues uh, have, have gone to the border now also to look into rumors that perhaps some people might have gone back. We understand that some people may have moved, uh, but they're mostly with, uh, with family members, host communities. So it's not the site where you see a lot of internally displaced people in one site and, and, and in need of assessment. assessment. It's more uh, a hidden phenomenon that we know that people have moved out of certain areas, have gone back to the areas of origin. Um, but it's, we haven't been able to actually quantify the number mm -hmm. uh, at this moment. Well, Karine, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Karine de Grul is a UNHCR spokesperson speaking to us live via Skype from Nigeria. Now, uh, following recent Islamic State uh, advances in Iraq and Syria, the international community is uh, voicing support for efforts to resist the militants. U.S. President Barack Obama discussed uh, strategies against Islamic State and global terrorism Tuesday at a White House uh, meeting with uh, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, as Latza Hoek reports. President Obama made it clear the United States is committed to fighting Islamic State and other terrorist threats in partnership with other countries. We are working closely with NATO allies to make sure that we are partnering with other countries uh, to address issues of counterterrorism, making sure that uh, uh, we continue to coordinate effectively in the fight against ISIL because all 28 NATO members are members of the coalition uh, to support the Iraqi government against uh, the ISIL fight. After talking with Mr. Obama Tuesday, NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg said the alliance is getting ready to deal with challenges from the Middle East and North Africa. We are adapting, we are responding, we are increasing the readiness and the preparedness of our forces. European allies are taking the lead in establishing a speed, a speed head force or a very high readiness joint task force. And uh, uh, in addition we have uh, the great commitment and the contributions uh, from the United uh, States. The meeting Tuesday coincided with the release of a British defense video showing its planes conducting air raids on Islamic State positions in northern Iraq, including their bunkers and artillery. The United States is providing advisory support and some military equipment to the Iraqi army. But the government forces need help from the local militias. It's not an ideal situation, Washington-based analyst Douglas Olivent told Alhura Television. I wish there were forces that were strictly under the command of the Iraqi government, but that's not the world in which they live, and having these forces participate is better than having Daesh retain Ramadi. The United States has warned Iraq's government against taking any actions that could reignite a sectarian conflict. 
Slavica Hoke, VOA News, Washington. I want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. Check out our headlines 24-7 at voaafrica.com. Coming up, why are some Agoa supporters calling for the agreement to be revised? Well, stay with us. A number of celebrities have turned 50 or are turning 50 this year. Wow, Brooke Shields, the now grown up beautiful Blue Lagoon girl. Can you believe it? Proud Funny of man Chris Rock turns 50. Since childhood, he's gone from everyone hates him to everyone loves him. God save Elizabeth Hurley, who plays the Queen of England on her new show, The Royals. Even at 50, she looks less like a queen and more like a duchess. Robert Iron Man Downey Jr. also turns half a century old. No rust on this Iron Man, at least none that I can see. And finally, goofball Stiller. Ben, that is. Still standing strong, but don't be surprised if his next attempt at blue steel has a few, oh, distinguished wrinkles. For VOA's Action Reaction, I'm Lisa Vora. Welcome back. Now, metals mined from conflict zones in places like the Democratic Republic of Congo are often sold by warlords to buy weapons. Uh, last week, European lawmakers voted to force manufacturers to prove that their supply chains are not inadvertently fueling conflict and human rights abuses. And we read you a report from London. They are known as blood metals. Tungsten, tin, tantalum and gold mined primarily in Africa and sold to make the latest mobile phones and laptops. But the vast profits are often pocketed by warlords, says Lucy Graham of Amnesty International. In places like the East DRC, Central African Republic and Congo, armed militia groups mine these products and then sell them for arms and ammunition. Those minerals enter the global supply chain and then end up in the products that we use every day. And at the moment, European companies have no obligation to check where the minerals in their products have come from. It seems that is about to change. The European Parliament voted Wednesday to force European companies to ensure the minerals they import or products that contain such minerals are not contributing to conflict or human rights abuses in other countries. The law is modelled on the United States Dodd-Frank Act, under which US companies must inform regulators if they use metals from DRC or neighbouring countries. French lawmaker Marie Arena argued in favour of the European legislation. This Dodd-Frank Act achieved true change in the countries of origin. It took time, but it did achieve an improvement. Several European lawmakers voiced fears over the impact on local economies in Africa. Cecilia Malmström is EU Commissioner for International Trade. We do run a high risk of further disrupting global supply chains and driving them away from Africa altogether. We also risk creating trade diversion resulting in prejudice against individual countries or even whole continent and that would lead to plummeting prices for minerals from certain origins. Amnesty International says European industries lobbied heavily against the move towards compulsory oversight of supply chains. I can't overstate enough what a groundbreaking step this was. When the proposal originally came out last year, it was completely voluntary. The proposal for a compulsory system now goes to individual EU member states for further scrutiny. Campaigners say Brussels has sent a powerful message to big business that profits made on the latest technology should not have their origins in war. Henry Richwell for VOA News, London. Well, the African Growth and Opportunity Act, a trade provision that allows thousands of products from Africa to enter the U.S. tax-free, is due to expire in September. While the U.S. Senate has recently passed legislation to extend the act for another 10 years, it still has to go through the House of Representatives. Meanwhile, many say the program needs major revisions. Here's viewers Maria Madiallo. When President Barack Obama visited Africa two years ago, 
people were visibly excited. But some local business owners like Sadia Gay in Senegal hoped he'd address the export barriers which she thought are still too high for small businesses like her clothing design workshop that exports to the United States. In the textile sector, AGOA brings with it lots of restrictions. Since we signed the agreement, people are always holding meetings left and right. But I believe that we have not been able to do anything real. VOA spoke with Serin Alou Diop of ASEPEX, the agency in charge of promoting Senegalese exports, including fisheries, agricultural and artisanal products. Today, after 13 to 14 years of being eligible, I don't think Senegal has really benefited from AGOA. Some of it is due to the limited financial capacities of our companies, the quasi-inexistence of cargo flights to the U.S., and the strict rules regarding our products. According to the U.S. Department of Commerce, the top five AGOA beneficiary countries are Angola, Nigeria, South Africa, Chad, and Gabon. Among other leading beneficiaries is Lesotho, which has one of the largest textile industries with 40 plants mainly run by Asian businessmen. While the program is working for countries like Lesotho, it's not the norm for all the eligible countries. In its peak year, 2008 was 80 billion dollars. However, 2014, just last year, it finished the year 23 billion dollars. Rick Helfenbein is the chairman of the American Apparel and Footwear Association. He says AGOA can do better. 67 uh, percent was energy related. Where was the other 33 percent? 20 of the 33 percent is South Africa. That means what's left, 13% of the 33% in non-energy is coming from 35 countries, underutilized, completely underutilized. Last year, U.S. import from sub-Saharan Africa decreased by 32%, according to the U.S. Department of Commerce. The reason was mostly due to a 51% decrease in U.S. oil imports from the region. But Orrin Hatch, who heads the Senate Finance Committee, recently praised the trade agreement. Since a goal was enacted in the year 2000, trade with beneficiary countries has more than tripled, with the U.S. direct investment growing more than sixfold in that time. The program has helped create more than two million jobs. Hatch, who helped craft the reauthorization language for the new bill, says that to improve on AGOA's past successes, it's important to allow both Sub-Saharan Africa and the U.S. to benefit from expanded market access. In Washington, Maria Majalo, VOA News. Let's stand up for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54, just in time for summer. Could this be the newest trend in barbecue? We'll be right back. If you've just joined us, I'm Mariama Diallo, and here is a quick recap of today's headlines. In Libya, Prime Minister Abdullah Al Thani escapes assassination attempt by unknown assailants. In Mali, thousands of pro-government supporters march in the capital against Tuareg-led violence in the north of the country. In Kenya, police clash with al-Shabaab militants in Garissa near the Somali border. In Sudan, U.S. aid sends nearly 50,000 tons of food to the country's conflict areas. Finally, in Ivory Coast, the African Development Bank, AGM, is currently underway in Abidjan, where shareholders will vote on a replacement for Rwandan bank chief Donald Kaberuka. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.
Welcome back. Uh, now for the latest pop culture news and social media buzz, here is Africa 54's Esther Gidhu Hewart. Esther. Hello, Vincent. Here's what's trending. The drama down under never ends for Johnny Depp. After illegally bringing his two dogs to Australia, the Oscar-nominated actor could face up to 10 years behind bars. Depp, who is currently filming the new Pirates of the Caribbean movie, landed himself in trouble earlier this month when he brought his two Yorkshire Terriers to the country on his private jet. He failed to declare them, breaking the country's quarantine laws. The star could also receive a fine of up to $340,000. Even the pilot who flew Depp and the dogs into the country could get two years as well. Depp has had the two dogs, Bo and Pistol, flown back to the United States earlier this month after officials threatened to put the pups down. Stay tuned. Next up, could this be a new barbecue trend? Syracuse University in New York has successfully cooked steaks over a stream of lava, as you can see in this viral online hit video clip. Participants in the project set up a trough to stream the lava and used the generated heat to cook the steaks. The meat was placed on a grill over the artificial flow, enabling it to cook until blistering hot. This experiment was part of the Syracuse University Lava Project and was made in collaboration with sculptor Robert Waisaki and geologist Jeffrey Carson. And finally, to the victors go the spoils, a giant wheel of British cheese. The rest are lucky to come out of it without a trip to the emergency room. Presided over by a cheese master, the annual cheese rolling race has been raised and won in front of a crowd of thousands, as is tradition on Cooper's Hill on the outskirts of Gloucestershire. The races themselves begin with an eight-pound round of double Gloucestershire cheese being hotted down the hill before the racers follow its course. Participants are warned they are participating at their own risk. One sign read, cheese rolling is a dangerous activity for both participants and spectators. The cheese roll is not managed. You are strongly advised not to attend. And that's what's trending today. Vincent, back to you. Yes, yeah, some cheese worth dying for. What, what a world. That's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. Now for more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show, African News Tonight at 1800 UTC. And in the mornings today, break Africa between 0300 and 0600 UTC, Monday through Friday. Thanks a lot for watching. From all of us here in Washington, have a good night. Shaka Sully, host and senior editor of VOA's international calling talk show, Straight Talk Africa. Today we'll examine the tobacco industry. We pretty much touch on anything that you can think of. Politics, health issues, human rights issues, you name it, we talk about it. The issues that we discuss are pertinent to most people on the African continent. A very, very rare and unique opportunity to interact with their leaders.